to the Middle East and the Mediterranean uh, from 2000 BCE. So that's 4,000 years ago. Understand that that's BCE before Common Era. Uh, here are the main points of our chapter. The cosmopolitan Middle East, the Aegean world, the Assyrian Empire, Israel, Phoenicia, and the Mediterranean. And last is failure and transformation. <clears throat> So it can't be underestimated the importance of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, as human beings emanated out from Africa and the Middle East, you know, the obvious choice of direction was towards this great body of water. And as you see from the image here, these, these ancient civilizations tended, tended to ring the coastline of the sea. And the sea was used as a, as a corridor for transportation, for, for, for trade and travel and so on. And all these ancient civilizations interacted and, and, and became connected. Uh, you can't also underestimate the importance of the Iron Age in this era, a uh, period marked by the use of iron implements, tools, and weapons. So the Iron Age immediately followed the Bronze Age. So bronze was a hard metal made from copper and tin. So bronze is an alloy or a mix of two metals. Um, bronze replaced items made of stone, going back to the Stone Age. Not, not just arrow and spearheads, but things like pots, bowls, sculptures. Anything like that became much stronger and lasted longer with metal as opposed to stone. <clears throat> the problem with bronze is it wasn't strong enough to build anything with uh, until the discovery of iron. So, so bronze, you couldn't really support multi-structures, one, two, three stores, it collapsed, but iron uh, it was strong enough to, to hold those kind of structures up. Uh, so not only was it strong enough to, to, to do that, but also make very deadly weapons, swords, maces, and armor. So, of course, you know, warfare became much more advanced. Um, so the Iron Age is the third era in archaeologist Christian Anderson's what's, what's called his three-age system. And most historians look, look to this to determine these, these periods. Stone Age, we talked about period when, when weapons and implements were made of stone, wood, bone, or some such material, and during which very little or nothing was known of metal. Uh, and then came the age of bronze, the discovery of metal. Weapons and cutting implements were made of copper or bronze, uh, but nothing at all or very little was known of iron or silver. And then you have the Iron Age, begins in 1300 BCE, where iron was used for those articles to which metal is eminently suited, strength, and the fabrication of which it came to be employed as a substitute for bronze. So the Iron Age in Mesopotamia is dated around 1300 BCE, and then slowly the Iron Age starts to dawn in other parts of the world. It didn't happen, you know, all over the world at the same time. It came to different uh, civilizations at different times. Uh, India and Europe, the start of the Iron Age is about 100 years later, 1200 BCE. But it doesn't happen in China until 600 BCE, about 700 years after Mesopotamia. And Japan is late as 100 BCE, 1,200 years after Mesopotamia. So is that an indication of, of not as advanced uh, technologically? Not necessarily. You know, we, we come upon discoveries as we need them. I mentioned before that Asia was, was somewhat isolated by the Himalayas and far away and they, they didn't have the same issues that Mesopotamia had, where you had, you had, you know, empires uh, uh, invading you all the time. So when you're under constant invasion in that type of thing, technology tends tends to go quicker. And the same same thing today, technology increases when we have a need for it. So Mesopotamia had a had a need for for stronger metals before Japan and China did. So it's important to understand these three these three eras. Oops, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> as a measure of progress in humans or of humans and how each era contributed to a sophistication of people. Progress meant invention, meant leadership, organization, community. Okay. So these early chapters in our book are mostly filling in the blanks of these very ancient peoples that preceded uh, the Greeks and the Romans that we're heading towards. So we're, so we're moving towards the classical eras of Greece and the dominance of the Roman Empire. But before we do that, let's learn about these first ancient civilizations and how they were connected and how they linked together. 
Okay, your first section in your chapter is entitled The Cosmopolitan Middle East, 1700-1100 BCE, 600-year period. How did a cosmopolitan civilization develop in the Middle East during the Late Bronze Age, and what forms did it take? First of all, what does cosmopolitan mean? <clears throat> it's a time of widely shared cultures and lifestyles. So going back to Mesopotamia, it really had two zones, uh, north and south. And you see to the north you have Assyria, and to the south you have Babylon, which we've talked about a little bit. Uh, so Mesopotamia has the rise of these two very early civilizations. Uh, and we've already talked about, about Hammurabi and Babylon. Uh, the, city, the city of Asher, uh, which is right here, is part of Assyria. That's the capital of Assyria, 20th century BCE, a very important trade city. Uh, and they would trade up into Anatolia, which, of course, today is modern-day Turkey. And you have the rise of the Hittites in Anatolia. Uh, the Hittite capital was uh, Hattusha's up here. Uh, so the Hittites were the first in Mesopotamia to develop iron, and they kept it a secret. Of course, if you can keep that, that kind of information from your enemies, they, they can't match you with weaponry and, and so on. So they have metal and, and their opponents don't. They're going to dominate. So they kept it a secret for as long as, long as they could. And they became fierce with chariots. And they gained advantages over others. And we'll talk more about chariots here in a minute. Uh, 17th century BCE going down to Egypt. We talked about Egypt in their, in their different eras. Um, but by, by 17th century BCE... Uh, Egypt was in decline, and it actually fell under foreign rule, the Hyksos. Uh, so the Hyksos um, were, were essentially running Egypt for, for a period of time <clears throat> until they were ex ultimately expelled. Once you expel the Hyksos, that's when the New Kingdom, or the Third Era, begins, 1532-1070 BCE. Uh, so the New Kingdom changed from the isolationism of the old and middle kingdoms. Uh, the new kingdom was about expansion north into Syria and Palestine, south into Nubia. And all, all these conquered places, they would demand tribute from conquered peoples. One of the uh, interesting pharaohs and rulers of ancient Egypt, it was actually a woman named Hatshepsut, first female Egyptian ruler, first pharaoh that was a woman. So the notion that a woman could be king in, in Egypt or Pharaoh was abhorrent to the Egyptians. This horrified them. They didn't want this uh, because she was a woman. And in their, in their mind were, were, minds were less than men and shouldn't be leaders at all. Yet Hatshepsut, I'm sorry, it's a hard word to say, Hatshepsut became the first great woman in recorded history. Uh, the forerunner of such figures as Cleopatra, Elizabeth I, Catherine the Great. Uh, she ruled as pharaoh for 15 years. So how did she end up in that position? Well, her, her husband, who was the pharaoh, he had died, and her son was too young to rule. So she kind of got caught in the middle, and she, and she took over. Let's watch a film here. Uh, please watch the film entitled Queen Pharaoh, Hatshepsut, and then come on back. So Hatshepsut's era was known for, its, its, it was an era of conquer and exchange of goods, of course, expanding trade. Uh, she was successful in securing valuable trade goods for Egypt, including myrrh. Myrrh was an expensive spice, spelled M-Y-R-R-H. Uh, myrrh was used for making perfume, incense, medicine, for anointing the dead. Uh, in ancient times, myrrh was an important trade item. If you know the story of the three wise men coming to see the baby Jesus, they bring him frankincense and myrrh. Uh, Hatshepsut launched an extensive building program, uh, mostly to repair the damage done by the invading Hyksos, and, 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 they, and she built magnificent temples. But on, in, in all of her statues and images, she is portrayed as a man. Uh, although they made her waist a little narrow, but they tended to downplay any of her feminine features to make her look like a man. Uh, so eventually her nephew became Pharaoh. And though the circumstances of this event are unknown, and what became of Hatshepsut, it's a mystery. We don't know whether she died naturally, she was deposed or eliminated, killed, is uncertain. But after her death, 
The Egyptians tried to forget about her, and they even defaced her monuments. Uh, her memory was scorned because she had been a woman ruler. <clears throat> so although Hatshepsut was given a burial in the Valley of the Kings, her memory was not honored. And soon after her death, her monuments were destroyed, her statues pulled down and smashed, and her image and, and titles defaced. Uh, let's go to our next film. Please watch the film entitled Pharaoh That Wouldn't Be Forgotten, and then come on back. Okay, so this defacing and trying to eliminate her, her memory may have been an attempt by her nephew, Tutmosa, who became the pharaoh after her. He was trying to gain credit from some of the successes Hot Sheps had experienced during her, her rule. So by removing all obvious references to her, uh, Tutmosa could incorporate her reign into his own and then would be considered Egypt's greatest pharaoh by history. If we can eliminate any, any memory of her or any evidence of her, everybody will think all of her gains are mine. I'll become the greatest pharaoh. So I'm sorry to say, ladies, but this is a very early incident against a woman. This is the start of a very long line in history that continues to this day. Women don't always get a, a fair shake in history. Uh, 20 years after her death, uh, Hatshepsut's name was removed from nearly all the monuments. Although, ironically, some of the best preserved monuments today in Egypt are those of Hatshepsut. Uh, another important ruler in Egypt is Akhenaten. A uh, very untraditional ruler. Uh, he decided to close the temples of all the other gods. So remember, back in these ancient days, these civilizations believed in polytheism or numerous gods, not, not one god or monotheism. They believed in numerous gods. But Akhenaten believed in just one god, and he worshipped Aten. Uh, Aten was the god of the sun disk. And he brings this idea of monotheism, one exclusive god, into, into play in Egypt. Very unusual in those days. <clears throat> in honor of the Aten, uh, Akhenaten constructed a new capital at an uninhibited place called Armana, out in the middle of the desert. So you look at the image here. You, you've, got the, you've got the upper and the lower sections. Memphis and Thebes are the capital of each, each one of these. But he builds this... this uh, capital in the middle, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, called Armana. Uh, an uninhabited place. And he chose that location because at sunrise it conveyed a symbolic meaning to him, but it, but it was very odd to do that. Akhenaten would marry Nefertiti. Uh, Nefertiti is considered to be one of the more beautiful women of the world, at least according to art, and she's in a lot of Egyptian art. <clears throat> And interesting, some of some of the works of art she's she's shown standing equal next to her husband Akhenaten. And historians have speculated that may that she may have become a co or even sole ruler of Egypt. Because typically in Egyptian art, women were always depicted lower than their husband in an image. The fact that she was equal to him has brought, you know, rise to this question that maybe she was involved in in in, in uh, rule. Uh, after Akhenaten's death, the other god temples, god's temples were opened, reopened, and the uh, idea of monotheism was forgotten for a while. Anyway, this will come back and become you know, popular as what we believe in today. Uh, Akhenaten's son was named Tutankhamun, or King Tut. And he's very famous today, and King Tut's, uh, the, the treasures of his tomb have been traveling the world for decades. And decades ago, Somebody discovered this the 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 vault of King Tut and found all these all these items you know very very uh, uh, expensive rich items. Um, the truth is, in his day, he wasn't that famous at all. He's famous today because he was discovered by archaeologists today, and we have all of his all of his you know belongings. But as a ruler, he was just kind of you know, mostly mostly somewhat would have been forgotten, only ruled for 10 years, and he died when he was only 19 years old, probably from malaria. So he ruled from the time he was 9 years old to 19, didn't, didn't make a, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, noise as a ruler, but because we've discovered his tomb today, he's very famous. Let's take a break and watch two back-to-back -back films, and both of these have to do with archaeology. Uh, the first film, please watch the film exploring King Tutankhamun's tomb, and then just go right into British archaeologists may have found Queen Nefertiti's remains.
and then come on back. <clears throat> okay, so the new dynasty was was ruled by Ramesides, uh, or Ramsi, Ramsi, Ramses the Great, Ramses the Second. Uh, he brings back conquest and expansion, ruled for a very long time, 66 years, uh, dominates the era, and lived into his 90s. Unusual for someone to live that long in that era. Had a major battle against the Hittites at Kadesh, but it came to a draw. And what what really created the treaty was that that uh, Ramses married uh, a Hittite princess. So during during uh, Ramses era, horses became you know more in use. Uh, long distance trade and metals became you know kind of an offshoot of that because you have horses to go further. So I mentioned uh, chariots before. It's important to understand what all comes together here. This is modern technology at its height in, in this era because you've got horses, you've got metal, metal wheels, metal weapons, and um, and you've got the wheel. Okay, so all all these things come together to create this very formidable fighting machine. You, it would be difficult for a, it, a an opponent to to. Uh, match an army full of chariots if you don't have that. They're going to run you over and, and wipe you out. As you see on the left, the, the guy standing there, he stands there. He doesn't have to worry about the horses so much. When you're riding a horse, you got to keep your balance. You've got the range in your hands and you're trying to fight somebody. Now you can just stand. Uh, of course, I would I would think that it would you'd have to learn to gain some balance doing this, but you can use your hands and fight while the horse is, you know, just uh, doesn't need to be, you know, tended to as much. So anybody with chariots became formidable in battle. <clears throat> okay, the next section in your book, <clears throat> excuse me, is called the Aegean World. What civilizations emerged in the Aegean World and what relationship did they have to the older civilizations in the East? So going back to the Mediterranean, you have these civilizations that start to develop around the Aegean Sea. So the Aegean Sea is right here. So we talked about Anatolia and Mesopotamia is down here. The Aegean Sea is right here, okay? And this is where the the uh, Greeks will, will come out of, right here. Uh, but before that, you have the Minoans, uh, civilizations on the, uh, a civilization on the island of Crete, which is, which is down here. So this is another image, Greece over here, Turkey and the Aegean Sea, which is this 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 area right here. Okay. Uh, so the Minoans lived on this uh, island of Crete, south of Greece, south of Turkey, is close up of it. Uh, and you have and you have the Mycenaeans, which would be where Greece would would emanate from. Uh, 2000 BCE, the Minoans were considered to be the first European culture. Uh, as you were moving further north and, you know, above the Mediterranean, you start to get up into what would become Europe. Uh, and also the first to develop complex government and advanced technologies. Uh, the Minoans participated in long-distance trade, and they needed to. I mean, as you can see, their land was different than the Middle East. It's an island. It's rocky, arid, no river valleys. They had to go elsewhere for their resources. Uh, and you can do that by trade, but many times you do it by by conquering and invasion also. So all this trade led to a, a blending of cultures. You know, the indigenous or native people of the land mixed with foreigners, and they're and they're forced to co-mingle for economic reasons. Uh, and that's good in on the one hand, you develop relationships, trade partners, but bad on the other: conflicts, disputes, war, new enemies. Manoa was named after the mythical, so keyword mythical, King Minos. So a lot of the Greek history that we have uh, comes from Greek mythology. So these are legends and mostly stories, but some based on fact. So because we don't have all the blanks filled in, we tend to rely on Greek mythology for a lot of the history of this era. So King Minos kept a monster called Minotaur or, or Minotaur. Uh, half man, half bull. He was imprisoned in a maze. Uh, evidence shows that these people, besides being one of the first advanced civilizations, were also very creative and artistic. <clears throat> so the Mycenaeans were considered to be the first Greek civilization. Okay, 
uh, and you have the rise of them in 2000 BCE. They overthrew overthrew Manoah. Hang on a minute. Probably something going off somewhere, right? Uh, <clears throat> they overthrew Manoah, although historians don't know for sure why or how that happened. But since they came into power and, and Manoah fell at the same time, that's kind of been the agreed upon reason that it was probably overthrown. Uh, so the Mycenaeans became the first Greek culture. And we show, we found evidence of much wealth and power. <clears throat> Archaeologists have uncovered what's called shaft graves with evidence and proof of, an of another advanced civilization. But the Mycenaeans were also heavily influenced by the Minoans, whom they presumably conquered. So, you know, again, not unusual. It's a human trait to copy something that is successful, even if it's somebody that you just conquered. <clears throat> There's also evidence of a huge citadel uh, built with huge stones. Uh, so a fortified building to protect the community, like a walled city. Uh, in case of danger. And le legend says that the one-eyed Cyclops put the stones there. So Cyclops is a member of a primordial race of giants, uh, had a single eye in the center of his forehead. And the word literally means round-eyed or circle-eyed. <clears throat> so, so moving further with this idea of mythology, let's do a supplemental lecture right here. And this is number two, and this is called the myth of the Trojan horse. So again, if you haven't taken the time, and you should have, it was an assignment in week one, but if you haven't taken the time to go over the instructions for what a supplemental lecture is, you need to do that before it gets out of hand. Um, go to modules week one, scroll down to assignment instructions and the written instructions and the video tutorials are there for, for all of the uh, assignments, okay? <clears throat> Moving to our outline. Uh, introduction, uh, who is, Ag who is Agamemnon? Number two, uh, Mycenae versus Troy, this long war that nobody could win. Uh, number three, uh, Odysseus and, and the Trojan horse. Give me details about that. <coughs> Excuse me, and the relevance. I'll give to you in the end. Okay, let's get started. So Agamemnon was, was the king, ruler of Mycenae, or Mycenaea. Uh, the Mycenaean culture uh, you know, is where the Greek... Greek culture will, will uh, evolve from. Uh, so Agamemnon was famous for his invasion of Troy. So going back to our Aegean Sea, we have Greece on the on the kind of west side of the sea, and right right across the Aegean Sea is Troy. And this was of course a you know a competitor of, of the Mycenaeans. And you have the legend of the Trojan horse. <clears throat> so so what is that all about? Well, the Greeks and Trojans have been at war with each other for a long time. Ten years of war, mostly a stalemate. Neither side was capable of defeating the other. Uh, one of the other Greek kings, Odysseus of Ithaca, had an idea. Why not build a huge wooden horse on wheels and say it was a gift, but big enough for a bunch of Greek uh, soldiers to hide inside of it? So they did this. Uh, then they made a big show that they were leaving, just they were going to sail home, except for the ones hiding in the horse, of course. Uh, and they made a big production out of leaving, so the Trojans would see them and think that they've given up and gone home. Uh, they've given up and left. Uh, although, in reality, many of them were hiding out of sight of the Trojans, so, so perhaps more than half stayed behind, but hidden. And while the, while the ship sailed away, they were only half full. Of course, the Trojans don't, don't know this. They think that they're all, they're all leaving. Uh, so the, so the, uh, the Trojans come out to the beach and they find this huge horse. Huge horse. You see how large it is compared to the size of, of a human at the bottom there. And they think, you know, what, what is that? But nobody knew. Uh, of course, the soldiers in the sub are keeping very quiet. Then they found a single Greek soldier hiding nearby who was left behind. And he told them that the other Greeks, uh, he, that he disagreed with them and they left him because they didn't like him. Of course, that was just part of the trick. They, they left him there to, to, you know, hatch this plan. Okay. So the Trojans asked him, what's this big horse for? 
and they said it was an offering to Athena. So who's Athena? Athena was the Greek virgin goddess of reason, intelligent activity, arts and literature, also the daughter of Zeus. So Zeus, who's he? He was the sky and thunder god in ancient Greek religion. <clears throat> he also ruled as king, uh, <clears throat> king of the gods at Mount Olympus. So Athena's birth is unique in that she did not have a mother. So according to Greek mythology, Athena sprang full grown and clad in armor from Zeus's forehead. <clears throat> so don't miss the obvious light to women here. Okay, but by being born only from the great Zeus, <clears throat> she was free of any of the perceived shortcomings and frailties of women. <clears throat> So the Trojans didn't want to upset Athena either. So they rolled the big horse into the city of Troy, but it was so big it wouldn't go through the gate. So they had to tear down a piece of the city wall to get the horse in. <clears throat> and they left the horse at the temple of Athena to be sure that they would please her. And then they had a big party to celebrate the end of the war because, you know, the Greeks went home. They, they must have given up. Of course, don't forget the Greek soldiers were still inside the horse waiting for their moment. <clears throat> Finally, everyone fell asleep and they were drunk and hungover. And then quietly, one by one, the Greek soldiers came out of the Trojan horse and killed the guards on the walls. Then they signaled to the other Greeks that were in hiding to come and attack Troy because the wall was broken down, the gates, the gates open, and they could get in now. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> So long story short, there's a great battle <clears throat> and the Greeks won. All the Trojan men were killed and all the women and children were taken back to Greece as slaves. And just for fun, let's watch a, a clip from the movie Troy from 2004 uh, starring Brad Pitt. And uh, just to kind of give you a feel for that era. <clears throat> Go ahead and watch the film entitled Trojan Horse Clip from Troy HD and then come on back. Okay, so maybe you've heard the saying, <clears throat> beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Okay, that's, this is where that, where that saying comes from. Uh, but it's interesting. The Trojan horse kind of has taken on a life of its own in our modern uh, culture. Um, University of Southern California are the Trojans, okay? And they have the Trojan horse. Uh, also, a Trojan is a virus. The Trojan horse is a virus. Uh, why is it called the Trojan horse? Because it's after this story because it missed because a virus misrepresents itself to a potential user as useful, routine, or interesting in order to persuade a victim to install it. Then once inside, once you install it in your computer, it attacks your computer. So the film says it was an offering to Poseidon, not Athena. That's Hollywood for you. It was for Athena. But who's Poseidon? Poseidon was the god of the sea and other waterways, also of earthquakes and horses. One of the 12 Olympians of Greek mythology that included Athena. Uh, so in the ancient Greek world, the 12 great gods and, and go there, were, there were 12 great gods and goddesses of the Greeks, uh, the 12 Olympians. And here they all are, including Zeus and Poseidon, Athena. Uh, Apollo, and so on. <clears throat> the Twelve Olympians. Uh, the name of this powerful group of gods comes from Mount Olympus, where the Council of Twelve met to discuss matters, of course, of course with Zeus overseeing everything. Okay? Okay, that is the end of that lecture. Let's do, uh, let's do the relevance real quick. The relevance is... Much of the ancient history of this time comes from Greek mythology. Obviously not a perfect source, but it is all we have to go on regarding this era. One more time. Relevance. Much of the ancient history of this time comes from Greek mythology. Obviously not a perfect source, but it is all we have to go on regarding this era. Okay, that is the end of chapter 2, part 1. Please go on to chapter two, part two. Thank you.